Welcome back to Hot Flashes and Cool Topics. Today, we are going to have a very interesting conversation on testosterone. We always think about estrogen and progesterone when we're thinking about our hormone fluctuations, but testosterone is in there and it's an important conversation to have. So we would like to welcome Jackie Janelli, actually Jacqueline, but we're going to call her Jackie, and Janine Versi. Both are from Electra Health, as we mentioned in the beginning of this episode. And thank you, ladies, for joining us. Thank you for having us. It's um, an honor to be on this podcast that we have been uh, listening to and um, inspired by for several years now since we guys have going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're blushing. You just can't see it on the audio, but that's <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. And we appreciate, you know, it's funny because the, as we started doing this podcast, the circle becomes smaller and smaller companies. And we keep hearing about Electra Health and Electra Health. And we're like, we have got to get them on the show to talk to them as we talk about testosterone. So my first question would be, and I guess it's to Jackie as the registered nurse, what exactly is testosterone and where is it found in a woman's body? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great place to start. So testosterone, as you mentioned, is often left out of the conversation when it comes to female hormones that are important. And therein lies the problem, right? Because, you know, in menopause, certainly estrogen and progesterone, you know, they're the main culprits, the things we're focusing in on. But testosterone is very important for women, both in re the reproductive phase of life and beyond. Unfortunately, it's just not um, as well understood in terms of its physiology and how it works in the body. So what, you know, we do know a lot about testosterone in women. Um, it is actually the most abundant hormone in the female body in terms of, you know, how, just how much there is floating around. People don't know that there is about 10 times as much testosterone as there is estrogen in reproductive years. Wow. Um, yeah. And who as knew? such, you know, yeah, who knew, right? Exactly. And so it really is important, um, you know, in, in reproduction, you know, for fertility for women, um, that's often and not known, but also um, in terms of obviously sexual functioning, right? It is the main sort of hormone of desire for women. Um, and we do know that it is important for bones. It's important for our muscles. It's important for cognition, um, a feeling of vitality. We know that women who have sort of higher testosterone level, levels are more willing to take risks like financial risks. There's some studies to, to, to suggest that. So I think, you know, there's a lot of things, you know, that testosterone is doing in our bodies, probably beyond what we even know. There's receptors in every body part, brain down to our toes. So, you know, we, we need to learn more. We need to study it more, but that's, um, you know, what it does as far as where it comes from. Um, about 50% is made, you know, in the ovaries um, alongside estrogen and progesterone, but we also get about 50% um, in sort of its precursor form coming from the adrenal glands in the form of DHE. So, you know, a little bit more complicated in terms of, you know, what we do and we don't know, but really important. And um, I'm glad we're having this conversation today about it. Wow. I mean, I, I knew that it played a role. I was um, on the cream, I guess, form of it. And so I knew it played a role, but I had no idea that it contributed to reproduction. I mean, you know, I knew the desire part, <laughs> but I, did, I didn't know the reproduction part or just all of the parts or that it was the, you said the largest uh, hormone in the, I mean, not largest, but the most abundant in the body. That yeah. is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you, Jeannie, okay. do you find that women who contact Electra Health, because obviously you're a platform that answers questions, do a lot of them ask about testosterone or women like us clueless about testosterone? Well, we, we hate to say clueless. Um, <laughs> we'll say, but, you don't have to, we'll say. <laughs> but I, I think that once in a while, we do get a question that comes in. It's often in the context of sexual medicine or sexual health needs. Sometimes someone has heard something from a girlfriend or through the grapevine, um, but it's not often one of the you know first questions that a person comes in with. Um, but as we take folks through what we call our metamorphosis um, platform and community, which is where we provide education and content and access to an electric guide, which you could think of as a menopause doula, who's an expert to help you navigate the journey. So as women are going through and learning about the hormones in their body, what is happening over the course of menopause, 
testosterone is one of the ones that we do explain and describe. And so that's when you see increasingly questions come up. I love that menopause doula. I don't know if I'd heard that term before. I love, I love that. I feel like that, that would be a great thing. Having I think like, we need, somebody we need to guide you through that. Everywhere for everything. Yeah, we do. We do. <laughs> we you interviewed know. a death doula a while back. Yes. You know? yes. It seems yes. like there should be a doula for every stage of life. You're right. I like that. I really yeah. like that. Yes. So I have another question too. I know I've read it a million times, but can you, um, and I think this will be for Jackie, talk about what DHEA is again, like you said, that was, so can you go over that again? Cause I've forgotten and I bet the listeners might've forgotten as well. Yeah. So DHEA is an adrenal hormone. It comes from that gland specifically. And you can think about it kind of like a precursor, like sort of a mother hormone to both testoster- testosterone and estrogen. It kind of gets to decide what it wants to morph into downstream. So interestingly, DHEA is available over the counter in the United States, but we are, I think, the only country in which that is the case um, because it has the potential to impact hormones. It actually is unregulated in the U.S. Um, So I do always caution women who are considering DHEA, you know, in supplement form to do it under the guidance of a a trained practitioner who knows hormones. Wow, that's a big thing. I didn't know. know Wow. I didn't either. No, Look, you took us aback. We needed a moment there to just yes. protect ourselves. So if you were speaking with someone on the platform and they said, I have adrenal fatigue or I'm starting to, you know, my tests show that I have less testosterone, would you be inclined to recommend DHEA or would that be something that you would be hesitant to recommend to either women, to either woman? Yeah, so adrenal fatigue is definitely a little bit of a controversial term. It's really not recognized by conventional medical, you know, societies. Um, it kind of, you know, dabbles more in the functional medicine realm, um, but it's become very colloquial for us to just, you know, mention adrenal fatigue, general fatigue, you know, is a symptom of low testosterone for sure. But so are a lot of other things in menopause. So I would, I would, um, you know, tell somebody to, to learn about, you know, their adrenals and understand what goes on, but it's a really complicated symptom to treat in the context of menopause, because maybe they're not sleeping. Maybe they're, you know, they're really stressed out with all the thousands of things that women in their forties and fifties need to get accomplished in a day. There's just a lot going on. So it really, warrants a more thorough workup. Um, and so I, I wouldn't just, you know, say here, have your, you know, your bottle of DHEA and, and have a nice life. I would be more careful. Good to know. Okay. Well, that's, you know, and let's stick back on the testosterone topic. As women start to, as our hormones start to fluctuate, women immediately think my estrogen has declined. And that's kind of the first thought in our heads. When does your testosterone start to decline and how quickly does it decline? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think one of the misconceptions about testosterone is that like estrogen and progesterone, it's kind of falling off a cliff in midlife. And that's just not the case. Um, Yes, you know, estrogen falls, you know, precipitously towards the end of perimenopause. And that is responsible for a lot of you know, the classic symptoms of menopause that we know, hot flashes, night sweats, like, you know, vaginal dryness, things that, you know, classically come up. But testosterone actually peaks for women in the 20, in your 20s and 30s. Um, and slowly, slowly, like just in a nice straight line kind of comes down and out, you know, if you retain your ovaries, if your ovaries are still in, you know, you didn't have them surgically removed, you will continue to even make a little bit of testosterone postmenopausally and, you know, just kind of at this flat line level. And remember, your adrenal glands are still there, you know, kind of kicking in whatever they can along the way. So just because you're menopausal does not necessarily mean that you're deficient in testosterone. However, you're probably on the lower end just by, you know, your general age. So I think, you know, women feel it much more during the, during menopause because there's just a lot of hormonal fluctuations happening. And so if they were kind of getting by with, you know, some of their estrogen in their early forties, late thirties, and now that estrogen is gone, they are really feeling that dual impact of low testosterone and low estrogen together. Um, and it's problematic for a lot of reasons. What's, can you talk a little bit about the controversy with testosterone? Because there always seems to be some controversy about taking it or how to take it, or especially with pellets, but there just seems to be more of a controversy over taking some type of testosterone replacement. Can you talk about that? 
Yeah. So, you know, they're really the, the use of testosterone for women, it really shouldn't be controversial because we have really good evidence, you know, lots of rigorous studies to show that for hypoactive sexual desire disorder, which is a di clinical diagnosis in, you know, in women, postmenopausal women, we know that testosterone is important. We know that it helps restore sexual functioning across a broad range of domains, arousal, orgasm, libido. So it's not that we don't have the knowledge to say that testosterone is important. It's more just that there is no FDA approved testosterone product for women. And that's you know a complicated conversation to have too. And we can certainly get into that. But because of that, we've sort of, you know, like thrown it out to the wild, wild west to these hormone clinics who are just, you know, kind of using some predatory marketing and, you know, giving testosterone to women in doses that are way too high using delivery methods like pellets that can potentially be dangerous when done inappropriately. Um, and they're not managing the complications of that. So, you know, they're, they're giving these doses and women feel really good. I'm not going to lie, right? If your testosterone is zero and you get a really high dose of test testosterone pellet, you're going to feel amazing. But what happens then is that the levels drop and women like, I want to, or like, I want to feel like that again. Right. And so they go back for more and it requires sort of this ratcheting up of dosages to the point where women are, you know, stuck with mustaches and, and you know, and lipid derangement. So it, it isn't, um, you have to be really careful from whom you get your testosterone, if it's something you're going to pursue. And that's not to say you shouldn't pursue it, but you should just try to do so in an educated um, manner. And I'll certainly Electra Health, you know, is happy to answer questions from folks about how to do that if, if need be. Why do you think the uh, FDA won't approve it? Do you have any ideas why they won't? Um, I don't know, Janine, <laughs> if you have any ideas or either one. I mean, I think, Jackie, you're, you're closest to it, but I could say just more broadly um, that it, I think throughout women's health, but particularly when it comes to the space of life, we're plagued with these issues of there's not enough research there's not enough treatments and it becomes this chicken and egg problem. And so if there aren't folks that are advocating for research in a, in a given area, um, then it sort of gets relegated to sometimes more like fringe treatments or off label. Um, and then it becomes tainted potentially making it even less likely to hit the radar of regulators or to look appealing to pharma companies and innovators in life sciences. So it, it has this um, sometimes vicious cycle effect when it comes to drug development and the, you know, the process of, of shuttling um, drugs through a very long process um, for, for safety and for clinical efficacy. And so stripping out, you know, what is kind of misogyny and like, what is sexism? The like big isms in that is hard to do, but I think we probably know just from looking at the numbers of the treatments that are available that come to market to treat the intimate needs of, of women rather than men, um, that there's a pretty healthy unbalance, but hopefully, you know, we can be part of like having this conversation and then elevating that to um, some of the folks that are making policies and, and making decisions. So would you have, you know, a great way to advocate for that just for your everyday woman? What's a way to do that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think speaking with your doctor um, is a starting point, right? So um, speaking up and out, Electra's mission is to smash the menopause taboo. And we truly mean that once we start having conversations openly and we get away from that like cringe, shame, my, you know, Alessandra, our CEO has this great um, phrase, uh, which she borrowed from her grandmother, which is, you know, um, if you, if you whisper it, you shame it. And if you shout it, you conquer it. And so, you know, it is a little bit of of finding every opportunity, starting with the healthcare community, but also in the mainstream, you know, like, podcasts like these um, to make this known as a set of issues that matter to a lot of women. And then there are specific opportunities, you know, around, you know, for the folks that are following along and want to like understand, is there a congressperson voting on bills that relate to women's health? Is there money earmarked for that research? I spent a little bit of time in the federal government. So 
you know, I know it can be pretty impenetrable, but I think there are nonprofits and there are advocacy groups that are out there keeping a close watch on what gets funded and not funded. And really that's how, um, you know, innovation in the private sector is oftentimes starts with money from the federal government in terms of grants. Um, so, you know, there, there is that avenue. I would love to, to spend a whole podcast talking more about this. <laughs> we'll have how to, to do that. We'll have to yes. have you come back and talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the things that women are just now starting to realize is that the perimenopause, menopause stage can be up to 10 years of their life. And you go, you know, like you said, step one is to go to your doctor, but a lot of doctors were not educated enough. And it's not necessarily their fault. A lot of med schools are not teaching them about menopause. So can you tell our listeners a little bit about what Electra Health is and how it can help women who are now spending a decade of their life in this stage? Absolutely, be thrilled to. So the reason that Electra Health came to exist in the first place was recognizing that there is this massive gap in women's health where we see increasing interest in topics like fertility and pregnancy and really important areas in the woman's lifespan, but tend to be focused on the reproductive window. And yet menopause is this universal biological experience that we don't talk about and that we don't get adequate support for and that actually has effective treatments associated with the symptoms. So, you know, where many women are sort of, somebody said this today, you know, I was told to kind of white knuckle it. So if that is your perception of what you have to do, then, you know, why, why sort of bother to even ask the question? You may not get your question answered by your provider, but you might not even ask it because you already have that perception. So we really were founded to change that because we believe that women deserve to live well in good health over the long term. And what happens in those menopausal years does actually affect your long term health and wellness as we age. So, this is a third to half of our lives. And very specifically, um, there are three areas that we think are crucial for helping women navigate menopause um, to be really what we think of as, as their best selves and their most fearless selves navigating the world. Um, the first is education. So, there's really uh, poor education online. Dr. Google is, uh, I don't need to, you know, sort of tell not you. Our friend, not our friends. Not our friends. No, um, can be great for some things, but really in this space, there is a dearth of high quality, trust, trustworthy information from medical experts. So it's hard, like we were talking before about folks that have predatory marketing practices you know, you may be desperate for a solution for, you know, your night sweats or um, vaginal dryness and may not be able to discern between a clinic that's sort of like reeling in patients and a bit more of a pill mill versus like what is legitimate, credible research saying on a given topic. There's some surface level info on, you know, um, Cleveland Clinic or Mayo um, menopause.org from the North American Menopause Society, which we use and we heart, we really hew to that gold standard of research, but it can be pretty impenetrable um, for, you know, even, even well-educated folks, including physicians and providers themselves sometimes. Menopause medicine is complex. Um, so that's another thing I think people don't realize. Anyway, so the first bucket is really understanding what it is, what's happening, what to expect and what you can do about it. And then really um, the interventions themselves. And these, we, you know, for these, we take a really holistic view. This is mind, body, spirit. It often starts with reevaluating your lifestyle, what you wanna change, what you can change, how you can go about that um, in a reasonable way, because we often say you know, um, to ourselves internally, a lot of times this advice to women is like, be a better person, you know, like eat well, sleep well, exercise every day. And sure, that sounds great. Um, and for many of us is just, you know, uh, untenable. So how do we create the opportunity to make targeted lifestyle changes based on what our needs and our specific goals are and take it one step at a time and have the accountability and support of both experts and peers 
to get there. And so that brings me to the, the importance of community. And so I, I know that this is a really powerful community listening to this podcast. So, you know, they will appreciate what it feels like to have someone say, oh yeah, I've been through that. And like, don't, you know, don't worry, it will pass. Or like, I hear you, this is, this is terrible. Um, and I'm here to listen and here's what I tried. And it's, um, you know, that conversation that hasn't really been happening at a large scale that we're really excited um, to help, you know, bring to the masses with Electra's approach. That's wonderful. I think getting back a little bit to the testosterone, I would love for Bridget to just kind of tell a short version of her experience because we are prime examples of doing something because someone told us it was a good idea to help with menopause and learning through this podcast that maybe that wasn't the best approach. Right. So Bridget, can you kind of take that? Yeah. Advice? So I, you know, I, I was on bioidentical uh, hormone replacement. It, I, it was kind of like a clinic. I went in, it was actually a weight loss clinic. So I went in and saw they did HRT things. So that I saw it on Groupon and I went in and they had me on testosterone gel. Great. Um, it was I was doing fine. They would do the tests that you talk about the blood work that isn't always reliable, but they would do it when I went in every three months and they, they said, oh, you're, it doesn't seem like your testosterone is being absorbed through your skin. Do you want to try pellets? And I didn't know anything about now what I know now. So I did do the pellets. It was fine. Um, I thought it was going to make my life easier, but you have to go in every few months and get more pellets. So you have to cut open your skin, get the pellets put in. And I thought, well, this really isn't any easier than going in and getting the blood work done. And then we talked to a few other doctors um, that we've interviewed and they really were not at all fans of pellets. They were very concerned, just like you said about the levels of testosterone, like being way too high. Uh, for women, uh, really scary stories. Um, I think what was it? one of the doctors said they were some of the levels when they did their for blood transgender work female were, to were, male. were almost the same. Yes, the same level as people who are transgendering uh, from are going through to become a male. And I thought, okay, no, I'm not going in for my pellet refill, and I quit doing the pellets. So now I'm on just regular estrogen. Uh, testosterone gel again and progesterone and and I'm fine and I do notice that testosterone does make but but the doctor did prescribe the testosterone I can only get it at a compounding pharmacy so let's so, talk about that yeah Jackie, yeah gel cream pel- <laughs> when you do recommend testosterone which do you recommend the most and where can you find it? Can you do it by prescription or does it have to be like Bridget, a compound pharmacy? Great question. Yeah, no, it does. It actually does not have to be from a compounding pharmacy, although there's nothing wrong because we don't have an FDA approved product. Compounding pharmacies are certainly, you know, an option. Um, you have to have a good relationship with a with a good compounding pharmacist who knows what he or she is doing. If you're going to go that route, but the way that I tend to do it in practice is I actually use the, and this is what a lot of menopause practitioners and and sexual health practitioners do, is that they use the FDA approved male testosterone. So you know that what's in the box is what's in the box. And that can be a lot safer than you know going to some compounding pharmacy you're not sure about and just using it at one tenth of a male dose because that's approximately what a woman's testosterone level should be. Now, the way that we do, and this sometimes works quite well, I don't know in Nashville, I know in New York City, you can use a good RX coupon to actually bring the price down when you're paying cash. So I will always prescribe it for my patients. Insurance will 95% of the time deny it um, because that, you know, that's just not something that they think is, you know, important or indicated, even though we have, again, so much evidence to say it is. And so I don't even bother half the time. I just skip right over insurance and have my, my patients just use a coupon. And it really brings the cost down, honestly, to much less than compounding um, testosterone, but even less than some of the other medications you might. It's really pretty inexpensive when done that way. Um, so that's one way, I mean, you do have to sort of counsel patients, right. About, 
you're using, you're going to be eyeballing it, right? It's not going to be metered out for you. So you do have to really teach the patients alongside that risk and benefit conversation about testosterone, how to do it, where to do it, what time of day to do it, to do it after a shower, making sure your skin is dry, not to put it over lotion, right? To do it at the same time every day. There's just a lot of counseling that goes into testosterone replacement for women. And that's also not something that I think is, is done well by most practitioners, mostly because they don't know, or again, it's in these sort of these hormone centers that are just cranking through. So that's, that's how I tend to do it. And, and we're, we're really successful um, in practice. I think also too, I always counsel my patients that one testosterone replacement therapy for women is sort of a long game, right? If you're having hot flashes and you take estrogen, you're, you might feel better really quickly. And that's not the case with testosterone. It actually is kind of like filling your tank with gas in your car when you're on empty, you're putting it in the tank. Okay, now you still have to put your foot on that gas pedal and make the car go. And for women, that's the case with testosterone. Now you've got the, you know, the right hormones in place to feel better, but you still have to hold up your end of the bargain. And that might be changing the way you think about sex, working with a sex therapist, fantasizing, using a vibrator, if that's not something you've done before, understanding the concept that for women desire is actually more responsive in nature, meaning that you don't need to have a spontaneous desire in order to have a great sex life, right? You could actually just be more responsive to a sexual stimuli. So whether that's solo sex, partnered sex, you might not want to go to the party, but when you do go to the party, you're going to walk away saying that party was fun. I'm so glad I went. And that's, that's the way I encourage my patients to think about testosterone, because if I tell them that here, you know, here's this hormone, it's going to make you feel like you're 22 again, that's going to be disappointing to them. <laughs> so I think setting those expectations and again, counseling is so, so, so important. I can't stress that enough. Wow. I have learned so much because I never knew about that either, like doing the FDA male testosterone at one-tenth of a dose. And there's such wow. a stigma that women really don't talk about it. They would rather either just not have sex again in their lives or not enjoy it or just say, okay, I'm over 50. I'm not really going to you know, enjoy sex anymore. But you know, communities like Electra, there needs to be somewhere where you feel safe our podcast, I mean, Bridget and I are, are pretty open about what we talk about because we want women to know it's just a part of life. You know, there are options. You don't have to check off that box and close that door and say, okay, that part of my life is over. Because the stories we hear about women in their 80s having sex, Bridget and I sometimes are like, okay, we're young. We're like, we've got <laughs> decades of, yeah. to look forward yeah. to. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, it's true. I mean, after, you know, your kids are out of the house, you know, a lot of times women are really looking forward to that time of life with their partner reconnecting. And, you know, if menopause, you know, the hot flashes and stuff doesn't get them, it's like, well, where did my libido go? And the right. truth is that like anything you, you have to cultivate it. It requires mm -hmm. some work. Um, and that's an investment in, you know, in your own wellness, but also in your, in your relationship. And, you know, it's, it's one of the few pleasures, pure pleasures we have in life. So I think it is certainly a worthy cause, um, you know, for women after the age of, you know. And we don't have to worry about getting pregnant anymore. So there you go. Win, win. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> win. I don't. I don't, Colleen. You're oh. still having your cycles. <laughs> I know. Oh, please. These eggs are so old. They would be like, oh, there's cobwebs in there from those. They're, they're not getting, <laughs> they're not going Nothing's anywhere. Nothing's happening. Or exactly. They don't want to. They're like, eh. They're <laughs> what are some of the potential side effects? I know with testosterone, sometimes you have to work on the dosage and how much you're taking. I know Bridget even had said at one point I was checking her face for facial hair because she was I, too <laughs> Yeah. Well, Colleen was here and they called me at the clinic because I had done a blood level or, you know, did a test, but I was always waiting. Like you said, um, when you get out of the shower, like you had to wait before you showered or wait um, before you exercised. So I had to wait till after I showered, after I exercised, had an appointment, you know, had it went, they were like, they called me, I think we were getting ready to, to tape a podcast. And they said, um, are you getting facial hair? Are you getting a lot of acne? Is your voice deeper? Your levels are really high. And I was like, no, I, 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 I'm not, I don't. And I think I had gone in right when I had put it on and right. then I went in and had the blood work and it seemed really high. So those kinds of things have been so what are the side yeah. effects if you are taking too much or too little? Like, how do you know you have to work with somebody because it's just, 
You do. And this is where testing is an issue because most labs are not sensitive enough to, and not standardized from lab to lab. So testing for testosterone levels is, you know, done sort of with an eye to sort of a window of numbers, because like you said, the numbers, even during the day, depending on what time you put your gel on, you know, will, will vary, go up and down. And so, you know, it, while your numbers might have been high in that moment in time, it's really prolonged periods of time where levels remain at supra physiologic levels, like what you know you were, you were hearing from this other clinician, that cause side effects. So when we lead, when levels get too high and remain there over long periods of time, you can see things like hair growth, especially like on the chin, pimples, darkening of the hair on the body, especially where you're rubbing the gel in. Um, I mean, hair growth and acne are nuisances. And honestly, if you stop testosterone, those things go away in, in due time. What we get concerned about are side effects that happen at super physiologic levels that you know are potentially dangerous, like changes in lipids, right? You don't want you don't want that because that's gonna confer cardiac, you know, cardiovascular risk. Um, of course, things that are irreversible, like vocal deepening, for instance, we know testosterone impacts vocal cords. So vocal deepening and clitoral enlargement, um, those are two side effects that are potentially and often irreversible. So that's something that, you know, we will see in women who have been doing high levels of testosterone for a long time and then come to us in practice because they're just, they've moved or they just are looking for a new, new clinician. And it's like, you know, this is sort of what their body is used to now. So it can be a problem. I mean, but the truth is that for someone who knows what they're doing, the side effects are mild most of the time and completely reversible. And we always do check levels once someone's on testosterone, mostly just for monitoring to make sure they stay in that nice, happy, healthy range. So if our listeners are saying, you know what, I think testosterone might be something that I want to look into and they go on the electrocyte, what would they find and how would they know where to go or what to ask for, I should say? Yeah, I mean, I could, yeah. So they are we, obviously at Electra Health, we are not prescribing testosterone to patients. Um, it's a controlled substance. And so it is not something that, you know, you can do over telemedicine. Um, but we will provide information about what proper testosterone replacement therapy looks like for women. And one really great resource if somebody's looking for a clinician in their area who can do testosterone replacement therapy is um, ISWISH, which stands for the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. They are like the premier women's sexual health um, organization. They work very closely with NAMS, a lot of, you know, cross-pollination there. And um, they are an excellent resource and, and really were a big part of the testosterone replacement consensus guidelines. They really, you know, spearheaded that whole initiative. This was a set of guidelines that were released, I believe, at the end of 2019, early 2020, um, that be due to this lack of knowledge amongst clinicians, due to the fact that women really, like, needed some guidance on where to go and who to see and clinicians needed the same, they said, here, this is, this is what we know. This is what the evidence is telling us. This is how we recommend clinicians properly give testosterone replacement therapy. And it's like laid out there for anyone and anyone to use and see. And we, we encourage both patients and clinicians to read through that carefully because that is, that is sort of the gold standard for, for women to follow at this point. And you said ISWISH, is that what you it's, said? ISWISH, I-S-S-W-S-H, -S -S yeah. Okay. <laughs> and we'll have that in the show notes for anybody who's yes. listening that okay. because Bridget and I will not remember those letters. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm That's writing the them down. Impossible <laughs> acronym to say. <laughs> and, and I, I, have, fast. I have one more question. I went on your website, um, Electra Health, and I saw something called the menomorphosis. And that it's on wait list, but I was like, what is this? And anytime someone tells me I can't have something, I want it. So <laughs> what exactly is that? And and why why can't I have it? <laughs> you can have it, Colleen. Thank you, you. you have it in. <laughs> Thank you. I know people. I, I'm on the wish list too. I signed up for that as well. <laughs> but yeah. you, women will go on there and be like, hmm, okay, what is this? So what is that? And and what can we look forward to being on the wait list for? Yeah. Well, so this is brand new. Um, this is what Electra is in beta testing around. And it is really the culmination of what I was describing before that, you know, holistic, integrative approach to helping a woman navigate the menopause journey. And so we think of it as the way to, um, you know, your roadmap to a better menopause transition with 
tailored guidance from our experts, um, online community, and access to your you know, very own coach. And so it's that combination of learn what we hear from our community is, you know, they're the busiest women on the planet. And sometimes when they're up with night sweats at 3am, which like I often am as well, that's, you know, the time that you might want to actually like binge some information, but you may not be able to join like a, a zoom at six o'clock, um, like some of, you know, some other platforms are hosting for other things. So we really designed it and co-created it with our community to be accessible, useful, bite-sized, both information, access to the community, and your very own Electra guide, back to the menopause doula concept. Um, and these are RN trained teams. So they're not providing, um, you know, prescriptions and labs, but they are, you know, trained medical professionals to help you navigate what is of the most concern to you, part health coach, part doula, part really fantastic resource for whatever question you might be trying to solve and navigate um, and to be your partner over the long term. And so we do also offer telemedicine care. Jackie is one of our amazing providers and literally like 10 out of 10, everybody loves her, which is probably no surprise. Um, but this is in addition, this is, you know, sort of in addition to um, you know, a, a one-time visit with a provider, this is like your home and your partner and your place to go and commune with others. Um, so there is a wait list because we are, you know, it's in demand and um, we want to make sure that it's a really welcoming experience for folks, but we would welcome the listeners of the podcast um, and we can definitely, you know, fast track some folks into metamorphosis. So uh, happy to answer more questions about it, but uh, it's right there on our website. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Well, we will definitely yeah. keep that in the show notes too. Go ahead, Bridget. Oh, I was going to say there were, I was on your website too, and just looking at the different types of things that I saw. Um, so I know the follicle stimulating hormone test. Um, that's probably the test that I had done when they did my blood work, but I saw a new test on there that they're looking at AMH. Can, do you, can you talk about the AMH test? Yeah, so the AMH is sort of a marker of fertility. It's sort of a indicator of the quality of the eggs that a, or follicles that a woman has left. And some there's some data to say that it can help us define the reproductive window. So when you know menopause, early perimenopause might be starting, and you know women become less fertile, but we are just not to a place yet where that is something that's reliable enough to really use as a benchmark. I mean, truly, testing is just not yet indicated unfortunately, for deciding when perimenopause begins and ends um, and menopause. And truthfully, we go, you know, an FSH can in some scenarios be helpful, but also there are such wide swings in hormones during this phase of life that you might feel awful. And then you get your labs and they look perfect. And you're just, you know, so it can, it can be a double-edged sword and it's because it's not just reliable enough. We just cannot recommend it at this point. Um, hopefully, you know, there are folks out there innovating for better ways to understand, you know, the journey that is perimenopause and menopause that is so different for every woman. Um, and so for now, that's, you know, that's what we help women do um, on Electra, you know, help them understand their symptoms, help them sort of see where they are in the, in the transition um, and help them decide what they can do, you know, what's in their power, both, you know, from a behavioral lifestyle, supplemental hormone therapy approach. We really, you know, we just want to help women help themselves. So that's, that's what that's and, oh, thank you. Thanks. I would just add to that, you know, I think we're in this era of, of interesting marketing in digital health, marketing directly to consumers. And for the most part, I think that it's really great because unfortunately the healthcare system does not um, treat everybody well and is not necessarily welcoming um, when folks come with, with different types of questions, especially when they are, you know, feeling the burden of that stigma. But it also means, I think, um, the opportunity to market to folks, you know, something like we can predict when you get menopause or like take this test and you'll get this, you know, grand picture. And I believe the science is amazing and it is, you know, evolving. But at this time, I, I hate to have women, you know, sort of spending money often out of pocket because insurance isn't covering it because it's not backed by evidence. Um, so, 
it, 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 there is sometimes this fear-based marketing that can grab women that, um, you know, kind of gets our goat here at Electra. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I was looking through just your page and it just has, or your website just has so much great information and the charts. And I had not, I was not aware of what that was, but I did see how it was still in the study phase or trying to just use some of that data there. Well, I think we're all in good company because we just want to get accurate information out to women who feel like maybe they have to go through this alone and they don't. It's no longer, you know, the longer you get stuck in that stigma, it's going to take you longer to find a solution. So just the fact that, you know, Jackie, you are just a wealth of information and we truly appreciate that you just kind of just kept answering the questions as quick as we threw them at you. So thank you. And Janine, you know, the fact that electric Electra health is out there for women, we want to get the word out because we, we get so many emails from women going, well, how do I get rid of a hot flash? And we're like, listen to any of these, like just pick any episode, you know, because for us, it's not just menopause. It's all about midlife, but Boy. it all affects menopause affects every aspect of our midlife. If we don't feel good about ourselves or if our testosterone is, is decreasing and our sexual desire lowers, it affects everything. So thank you for being out there and being a voice for women in our demographic. We truly appreciate it. Likewise, thank you for having us and thank you for shining a light on this topic. I think, you know, this is the beginning of a new era, I, I believe, and I hope. And there are so many just unbelievable women doing you know, sort of like shattering records and uh, hopefully changing the narrative around how we think about women as we age. And so we need more of it, um, but it's really exciting to get to work with you all on this. Well, thank, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it.